are, if the kids want to head back to Kids Church with Mr. David. I said Mr. David. Well, to them, he is a pastor. A couple announcements uh, for anyone that doesn't know. The tithe box is in the back. It's that treasure box back there for your tithe and offering. That's what I'm going to call it. Um, women's group that's coming up the second. Um, it's going to be, the study will be on version. So if you have version, it's called God of Ordinary. And it's a study of Ruth. And it's, you're just going to do day one. And that'll be Tuesday, May 2nd. Um, and that'll be in the Sunday school wing where you guys have Sunday school. For the men, um, we are just going to fellowship and have donuts. So fellowship, prayer, and donuts. That's that's what we're going to do, <laughs> and some coffee. Um, also, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we have Tragedy and the Triumph here. We're going to live stream it. Um, some great people with a, that has battled addiction and um, just different areas of their life. Um, we've got John Jonathan Kane. Not really sure. He was with some band. Um, Montel Jordan and his wife, Kristen. And then um, Brian Welch which was a um, member of the band Korn, and they will be talking about how God brought them from tragedy and to triumph. Where the doors are going to open up at 6.30, it starts at 7, and I believe it runs to 9, 8 or 9. But we'll be live streaming it here. Um, it's going to be live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, also, I don't know if there is anything else. I just want to give a quick... Thank you to everyone that's been serving back in Kidsville or Kids Church, Sunday school, um, adult Sunday school, and to everyone that's been helping out around the church, just cleaning it up and working so hard. Just thank you. And like I said, I, I've seen, I don't know if you guys have seen, but I was telling Jennifer, I think yesterday, that a lot more people have been stepping up to do things for God. And I've seen a dramatic change in this church. And if you remember what I said, it takes one person to spark someone else. And I believe that's what's happening here. God's moving here. And there's a lot of stuff that's going behind the scenes that God has worked out, and it's been amazing to see. So thank you all. Um, it's been a real pleasure to see just how God's moving and using each one of you. Um, also this month, we are going to be voting on two delegates to go to district assembly um, with, with me. I'll be there two days, and it'll just be two days long. It's in Mount Vernon, um, and it's just you'll just go and represent our church. So we'll, you'll be voting on two delegates to go do that. Um, information board out in the lobby and in the Sunday school wing, there is two bulletin boards with information on about NCO family camp, kids camp, um, tragedy and the triumph. We have, we're going to be in the National Day of Prayer this coming Thursday, um, and there's some other stuff, some other information about the sharing kitchen, about men's group, women's group. So take a look. Um, a lot of exciting stuff happening in our church. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we get to gather together and just dig into your word, Lord. I thank you for each person here, Lord, that uh, is just eager to do your will, to be in your will, to hear your word. Lord, I, these words are yours and not mine, Lord, and I pray that they would just come across boldly just as you want them to come across. Open up hearts and minds, Lord, I pray that whatever is given because you laid it on someone's heart, Lord, that you would just bless that. I pray for the ones that can't be here today, Lord, and that are watching online, Lord, and we just thank you for them as well, Lord. They're part of this family, and we just we love each and every person that watches online or is in-house, Lord, and we just thank you for the amazing movement that you've been doing here. We pray that the kids back in Kids Church, Lord, that they would just ready their hearts and minds for David's message, Lord, and just uh, just be seeking you and be in your presence, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in our last week of Believer's Boot Camp series. And today is a very special one. It's one of my favorites. It's going to be on the armor of God. So 
Did you know that we're in a battle each and every day? And Paul tells us to be ready and to be strong in the Lord. See, if the book of Ephesians is getting you ready to fight against the enemy, just like in Joshua, we are to be strong and courageous because he's getting us prepared to enter the promised land. See, I remember my mentor told me a long time ago that our life here, God's training us up on the way we should be living in heaven. He's getting us ready to be in his presence, to be face to face with him. So we're going to start off in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. So if you have your Bibles or you version, um, go ahead and open that up. <coughs> it says, starting off in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. See, we are called to be warriors. How many of you think of yourself as warriors? A lot of times I don't think of myself to be a warrior, but we are called to be warriors for God. And to do, to do that, we need to get ready for battle. We can't just be couch potatoes about it. We have to be ready. We have to be strong and courageous because we are in a battle each and every day. Satan is coming after us with Satan who is ready to attack us at any time. He is prepared 100% all day long, every day, night and day. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's a little chilling, right? Because we could be his, we're his prey. He's coming after each and every one of us. Just because we have a relationship with God does not mean that we're going to have this soft, cushy life where nothing happens to us, where we don't have temptations, where we don't go through sadness, and we don't go through pain. We still live in this broken world. But here's some, new, some good news. God is with us. When you accept God into your life and you start following him and you're in his word, he is with you. He is in your hearts, there, ready to fight with you. Each and every day. He is with us to give us strength and power. The power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. That power runs through your veins. That's powerful, right? Just let that sink in for a minute. The power that rose Jesus from the grave, that conquered death, lives in you. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we're in a battle each and every day. And the enemy will do all he can to get us to turn away from God because that's his main goal. The closer you get to God, the more he attacks. The stronger he attacks, the closer you are. If you're in God's will, you best believe he's coming after you. A lot of us has seen that. I feel like, I feel like every time, ever since we started ministry, Satan has just been pouring in on us, trying to get us to say, you don't need to do that, or I'm going to put a stop to this. I'm going to tell you, we serve a mighty God. See, Satan tells us lies like gambling is fine, drugs are fine, uh, pornography is fine. Gossip is fine. But these are lies. And then he tells us lies to justify those sins, to say that they're all right. And then we make excuses once he tells us those lies to make it seem like it's okay. Okay. 
we have to be ready for battle each and every day to fight against these lies. So are you ready? Are you ready to fight? How do we get ready for this battle? For this battle against an enemy that is always prepared, always ready, who knows all your weaknesses. He knows every struggle that you're going through. He knows every weakness to tempt you with. And trust me, he'll use them. He'll come at you with everything he's got. But are you ready for that battle? See, when when we're not in relationship with God, when we're not in his will, he leaves us alone. He doesn't come at us very often. Because he wants you to be in that place where you're not having that relationship. But the moment you start getting in God's will, those temptations come. Those pain, that pain comes. Those storms start coming at you. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, see, Paul reminds us, Christians, he reminds Christians that all of these tools are critical, that they're important. See, God's armor is a complete package. Think of like a casserole dish where all the ingredients are needed. They all work together to make that just delicious casserole dish, right? I think of like broccoli cheese soup. I know that's not a casserole dish, but if you just had cheese, it wouldn't taste as good, right? You got to put the broccoli in the seasoning or whatever else you put into it. But all of it together works great together. See, it's not a buffet with items where we can select only what we want. And don't get me wrong, I like buffets. But we don't get to pick and choose which armor we're going to put on. Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. See, we must have salvation, God's word, we need prayer and righteousness, righteousness, not one or the other, but all of them combined. All of these areas must work together to operate efficiently. Right? Think of a car. If, if you didn't have all the working parts in your car, it wouldn't go anywhere. You can't roll down the street without tires. Paul often groups spiritual ideas together to emphasize their importance. An example of his reference to this is the fruit of the Spirit, which mentions nine total attributes. So in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is a literal technique meant to imply that all listed areas are essential for the believer. This avoids the misinterpretation of picking and choosing which instructions a person wishes to pursue while neglecting others. See, when you put on the full armor of God, we get certain benefits from it. Satan can attack at any time, day or night. It does not mean it's the last day, though. But we are called to always be ready for battle. We have to be prepared for battle each and every day. From the time your feet hit the floor in the morning, you need to be prepared. And we do that by wearing the full armor of God. We are called to be prepared. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, it says, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. So we have to be ready. Because Satan is coming, whether we're ready or not. 
Whether you have that armor on or not, he's coming. This is not like back in like the Revolutionary War where two sides would stand there lined up and take different shots. No, he comes. He's that snake that just slithers up. Out of nowhere, ready to attack. Knows all your weaknesses. So if you're not prepared, how are you going to fight against that? We must be ready. We have to put on the full armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Stand firm, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness and peace. See, the first two parts of the armor of God are noted in this verse. Just two of them. Paul describes these parts as Roman soldiers. So this is kind of what a, this is exactly what a Roman soldier would wear. In order, they would have been put on. So he, the way he describes it is exactly what they wear. The way he describes it is how they would put each thing on. So first off, we're going to start off with the belt of truth. In that time, a belt was tied around the waist rather than buckled. It was therefore fastened, as Paul notes. There were not thin, pretty little strips of clothing that you see these young girls wear that, you know, just, Lily's got one, I don't even know what it does. Uh, it ain't meant for nothing. Just goes around her dress, it looks, you know, I don't even know. Fashion makes no sense to me, but. But a soldier's belt was thick. It was sturdy. It would be somewhat what a modern bodybuilder or weightlifter would wear today. It'd be huge. The rest of the soldier's armor connected to this belt, hooked right to it. God is truth, and we are to be securely connected to the truth. Satan fights with lies, and a lot of times his lies sound like truth. But as believers, we have God's truth. And every time, no matter what, God's truth defeats the enemy every single time. The enemy is good at what he does. Like I said, he knows your weaknesses. He knows exactly when to come at you. He is constantly prepared. He will use any means necessary to achieve his goal. And that goal is to get you to turn away from God. To separate you from God. See, truth binds us together. Everything else, we believe, it binds it all together. Without unifying truth, we're just disjointed, disconnected pieces. Let's move on to the breastplate. So the breastplate of righteousness, the belt would have held the breastplate into place. As well as the scabbard, which I had to look this up. I didn't know what a scabbard was, but it is what hooks to your sword. So it would have held, your scabbard would have been connected to this as well. A Roman's breastplate would typically be made of bronze and chain mail and would cover vital body parts such as heart, lungs, and stomach. Righteousness, or doing what is right, is essential to protecting the life of a believer. It's essential to protecting the life of a believer through spiritual battles. Also, the breastplate is a primary means of identification. I mean, would you walk into battle with a bunch of people that were dressed differently? You had no idea who you were fighting? You look over and all of a sudden you took down Chuck. That wouldn't be good. It was a way of recognizing each other. Likewise, Christians' behavior. Remember what I said, people are always watching. They're observing us. When we say we're followers of Christ, they're watching everything we do. Our behavior is our identification. It's how people know 
and see that we truly are believers of Christ. Right? I could, there's tons of people out there that say, I'm a Christian. They it's straight into a strip club or something. I've been a Christian for 20 years. They go off and kill someone. Or their, their mouth is, you know, slurring all kinds of bad, bad things at people or they're gossiping. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's tons of things out there. Would people really want to be around such Christian? <clears throat> it was meant to identify. Our behavior identifies us to the world and other believers that we are followers of Christ. We are to be different from the world. We're to look different. We're to be different, act different, talk different. We're to be more Christ-like. Each and every day, you should say, I'm one step closer to being more Christ-like. But also, we fight together. Right? We don't have to do these battles alone. That's why I think groups are so important. Sunday school with, you know, Tim and Gerald and, you know, this women's group and these men's group, they're important because we can fight with each other. We can pray for each other. We can walk these battles with each other. We are not to do this alone. That's why we're called a family. When others are going through things, you go through it with them. Good times and bad. Some have been through what you've already been through. Some are going through what you've been through. Someone, you could be going through something that someone else has already gone through. That's where our testimonies kick in and we get to help and encourage one another and be there for each other. See, last week we talked about responsibility that we have to raise the next generation. People are watching us battle. They're watching our behaviors. They're watching how we walk this Christian walk. If we say that we're going to be, we're followers of Christ, our actions and words better represent Christ. They better see God's presence in our words and our actions. So let's go to the shoes of peace now. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, it says, And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. See, Roman soldiers, they typically wore sandals, which allowed them to move quickly during battle and provided protection to their feet. Here, Paul imagines the shoes of of the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Shoes made a soldier ready to run into battle. The gospel of peace, likewise, makes a believer ready for spiritual battle. Have you ever walked outside barefoot? If you walk in the grass, you're fine, right? As long as there's no sticks. But how many of you grew up like with a gravel driveway? Do you ever walk barefoot in there? There's probably someone that did, but I never did because it hurt my feet real bad. I always thought, that's a bad idea. That's going to hurt. I tried to stay away from the gravel driveway. See, shoes also provide traction. The gospel anchors us to our faith. And certain basic truths, without that, we'd find our foundation slipping. With a firm foundation and the peace that only Jesus gives through salvation, we cannot be knocked down. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down. 
The, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. We don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want to lose our footing. It'd be like a, a lineman in a football game. If he didn't have firm footing and a firm foundation, he'd be pushed right over. We have to make sure that we are ready for battle. We have to make sure that we have a firm foundation, that we have traction to go. Not backwards, but forward. To be more like Christ. So let's go to the shield. Shield of faith. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, and with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. One of the ancient soldiers' most important tools was the shield. It was essential to protect against enemy attacks. Whether swords, arrows, stones, spears, any other kind of objects that might be thrown at you, even if you fell. This was such a powerful implement that the shields were often associated with strength. In the Old Testament, God calls himself a shield to Abraham and served as a shield to Israel. See, in Genesis 15, verse 1, it says, After this, the, world of, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, you, your very great reward. Shields were used in formations, cooperating with other soldiers. You ever seen like those old movies where the king is in the center and all the, all the soldiers, they gather around, they put up that shield or even today, when the SWAT goes out to like for riots, they all band together and make a wall, right? See, if we come together with our shields, can those attacks from Satan really get through to us? They were defining equipment in many battles. Satan will be hurling arrows and insults and temptations, but God is our shield. He's again, the shield against all that Satan will throw at you. We can see beyond the circumstances. When we have God in our heart and we're following Christ and we trust him fully, when we're all in, we can look beyond them circumstances and then we see the victory. We know that the ultimate victory is ours. So now we're going to go to the helmet of salvation and the sword, which is the word of God. In Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. See, helmets were essential in battle. A helmet can protect against stones, hand weapons, projectiles, fists, impacts with the ground, and other attacks aimed at the head. Soldiers knew that one hit to the head could mean disaster in a battle. For this reason, a helmet does not does more to put a soldier at ease than almost any other piece of armor. Paul associates the helmet with helmet and the armor of God with salvation. Salvation is ultimately the best protection against Satan, since nothing, even Satan, can separate us from God. 
in our love that he has for us. See, nothing can separate his love for us. Even when you're in sin, he still loves you. In Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, I, if you are truly saved, I mean truly saved, if you truly know God's love for you, if you know that gift of salvation, you, you know that feeling, that joy, that peace, that love that you have when you have God in your heart. Why would you ever want to give that up? I know that's a, that's a big topic for a lot of denominations out there that you know, once saved, always saved. Oh, we don't believe in that. But if you're truly saved, why would you want to give it up? Why would you, why would you know that, all that peace, that love, that joy, and say, I don't want it? Say, I don't, I don't think if you're truly saved, I don't think you'd give it up. I don't think there's a way. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the first offensive weapon mentioned. The sword was used to kill and defeat enemies during attacks. The typical Roman sword was not long. It was cumbersome weapon. Rather, they were short-bladed, easy to draw, and quick in combat. Paul refers to a short-bladed sword of this type. In the same way, God's word helps to defeat our enemies during spiritual attacks. During the temptation of Jesus, when Satan tempted him, Jesus used scripture to fight back. You can see that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. This is where Satan, when Jesus was at his probably lowest, he was hungry, he was cold, he was thirsty. He was out in the wilderness at his lowest. That's where Satan came at him. How did he fight him back? I mean, we have it right here in your hands each and every day. I bet you each one of you have a Bible. And if you don't, you got a cell phone. You fight him back with God's word. Because when you're in God's word, this is God breathed these words into existence. When you get into God's word, you come face to face with him. Those who study and know scripture can strike back. You don't think the enemy knows scripture? Remember, he's a fallen angel. He knows God's word better than any of us. That's why it's so important that we get into God's word daily we study it, it becomes a part of our life. Because if we don't, we're going to lose that battle. So we have to strike back against the temptation and prevent the devil from knocking them off, knocking us off, knocking us off our post. We have to stay in God's word daily. We have to be ready for battle. We have to be ready to fight back. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, And pray in the spirit of all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. See, we have to be seeking God. Are you truly seeking God? I mean, take, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but take a note. Are you seeking God daily? Are you seeking him all day? Are you praying continually? Are you just ending your prayer? Is it just a 30-second prayer? You wake up, 30-second prayer. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you for this meal. And that's it. Because that's not enough. 
We have to be seeking him. Because we know when we seek him, we find him. We are told to pray continually, continuously and often. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You want to be in God's will? Pray. Prayer is powerful. I'm telling you, we had that prayer and worship night here last week, and I'm telling you, God was moving in here. It was amazing to see people come in and just have that time with God. Prayer is powerful. And when we're all praying together, Satan runs. He will retreat. So seek God so that you are ready to fight. Ready for what the enemy will throw at you. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, Pray also for me, that whoever I speak words may be given me, may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I'm going to ask you guys, pray for me. Pray for your brothers and sisters. We have to be a praying church. Pray for your community. Pray for your family. Pray for your friends. Every time I hear pray, I I always think of my mother-in-law telling the story of, and I I know I've told you guys before of this this pastor that um, her and my father-in-law went to church with. And they were in a cabin, and he prayed literally all night, each person by name. Pray. We are ambassadors for Jesus, commanded to share the good news in love and in truth. So today, whether you're in a storm... And if you're not in a storm, you're getting ready to go into one. Pray. We must make sure that we put on the full armor of God each and every day. Because when you're getting ready to go into a storm, you want to be ready for battle. I'm praying for each and every one of you. I pray that you guys put on the armor of God each and every day. I pray that you guys have blessings in your life for you to be used. There's power in prayer. Know that when we have our full armor on, we will be ready to fight. Our strength comes from God and that power runs in our veins. That power that rose Jesus from the grave runs in your veins. We might not be able to handle it by ourselves, but with God in our hearts and that power sourcing through our veins, going through, I'm telling you, it just takes a little bit of his courage, a little bit of his strength, and you can move mountains. So we're going we're gonna to do an ending song here. And it's just time of worship. Prayer, whatever you guys need. Let God lead you. Let him speak to you.